Hey everyone, this is Jennifer Beamer, owner-operator of Actually Diet Art by Science, and welcome to 2023! Now, my 2022 was full of high highs and somewhat low lows. So when I'm talking about my crafting New Year's resolutions in this video, it's sort of one of those um, trips down memory lane and some bits I'm going to have to explain, mostly just because I think this is a really great example of how to kind of get on with things even when life isn't really turning out. And after having just reviewed my first video where I talk about my crafting New Year's resolutions and uh, the eight reasons why you should have them. That's because I basically lived uh, in a world where I was going to have to make certain adjustments so that I could still achieve what I wanted while being kind to myself. And that's really what I feel is most important about these New Year's resolutions in general, but also in the crafting specific New Year's resolutions as well. First things first, I wanted to actually make a sweater that fit me and that was basically 2022 for me is make a sweater. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to build in a couple of contingency plans in case things did not go according to plan, uh, which is kind of foreboding, some foreshadowing of how that year went. Uh, so one of the things I really wanted to do was just make a sweater that I would be happy to wear regularly. <laughs> and um, I thought I was going to use tin can knits, I think it was flax, the uh, pattern name. And I said first I'm going to use hand spun merino, which uh, was a fleece, well I bought three fleeces over uh, three consecutive years from the same sheep, um, washed it all, had loads of it, and so I thought, why sit around hoarding it when I should probably spin this into something? And so I started spinning it, I think during a live stream back in October or November of 2021. And then I sort of carried that element forward into 2022, finished all the yarn, and then it sat for a significant period of time. I did do one posted update video, um, I think it was April of last year, uh, where I showed off a little bit of my um, spinning process and kind of to hold myself accountable to make sure I was making progress on it. But the idea was if I couldn't actually get all the yarn spun and dyed and knitted, I would just say, hey, use commercial. So uh, I had loads of commercially available undyed yarn in my inventory and I thought well I'll just dye it if I don't spin enough. So that was my contingency plan. And then <laughs> when I was busy spinning it I thought hey how much yardage do you really need with a hand spun sweater? Because with hand spinning it sort of changes a little bit about how much yarn is truly called for in a sweater pattern because you're completely in control of how much you spin versus how much you buy because they're in 100 gram increments or sometimes 50 or 25 grams if they're very fine uh, and expensive. So if I needed 150 grams, I could just spin 150 grams for something versus having to buy 200 grams but only using 150 grams of it. So in order to get a sense of how much yarn I would actually need and kind of using some established guidelines to help, I did the crazy thing and I just looked at my stash yarns to see what I had available because that was another thing that I wanted to uh, look at was condensing that down a little bit and asked whether I could pull any yarns together to make probably a sufficient yardage amount so I could actually make a sweater to see how much <laughs> I would really need. So <laughs> cut to my pre-sweater sweater. sweater. <laughs> 
which was this lovely thing. And it was a tiny bit disastrous because the red bled down into the white. And I talked about this in my last video, my daily vlog number 59, and how kind of devastated I was um, with that bleed. But I got some really great feedback uh, about this particular problem. Uh, where I'm going to try to do a deliberate bleed to see if that kind of goes down into the white or not. Um, and so I found with this one, it was about 1,100 yards in total where I used two different uh, types of wool. I used Columbia for the top and I used my handspun merino for the bottom. And I did a calculator recipe knit where I put in my gauge and my measurements and I put it um, into, uh, oh, I actually don't remember what it's called, but uh, I will post below in the description the actual name of it, because uh, I think you can only access it via the Wayback Machine. Anyway, moving forward. <laughs> so I put in my gauge, uh, which luckily for both of these was pretty much identical. Um, so this is kind of like my home gauge that I like to spin. So it was very easy for me to take that gauge and create a sweater where it looked like it was designed to be this way all along, uh, even though I didn't actually anticipate these two yarns going together into the same project in this sort of sense where gauge would matter. But I was very happy with the construction, and so instead of using the tin can knits, I decided to use another recipe where I used my gauge rather than um, following a, well, trying to figure out how to get my gauge to match a pattern that was based on commercially spun yarns, mainly because spinners have a lot more control over things like um, the twist, the amount of twist you put in there, high versus low, number of plies, uh, even the type of wool you choose can actually impact the, the way that the fabric feels. So these are all great choices for us, but it sometimes makes it more complicated trying to get our hand spun to fit into commercial patterns. And I know there are ways that you can sort of reconfigure patterns for that. I actually just enjoyed doing this and it was really, really easy because I had done so many failed sweaters. <laughs> that I could very easily do a um, recipe of how to do a raglan <laughs> sleeve. So um, I opted to just do the same thing, but make a couple of different variations, just so that it would be a little bit different than this, and so that I could have both available when this pattern goes live. So I said that 2022 was a period of high highs and somewhat low lows, and the highs included graduating, spending 20 years in higher education, I was ready to be done, <laughs> and my mom was gonna come and visit me to sort of see me and the UK, and also watch me graduate because she's been there through the whole thing, and so of course she was going to be there in person to witness it all. So uh, that was also roughly the time I was doing tour de fleece and trying desperately to post <laughs> new videos every single day, I don't know why I'm a glutton for punishment. And I also started a new weaving project during her stay. So I very much overburdened myself with lots of things, thinking I could actually accomplish it all. So I was very busy. I was happy doing what I was doing. I graduated. I'm a doctor, <laughs> although you don't have to use doctor. Um, but I also had a bit of some lows. So having a doctorate makes you think that job prospects should be pretty much there. Like you might not get your dream job and it might take you several months to actually get something. But the number of blows I was delivered uh, in terms of trying to find anything, didn't matter what it was, just anything that I could see myself doing to pay bills. As many of you have probably seen during my live streams, I mainly worked Saturdays at a chocolate shop back in Leicester, and occasionally I would work, work Friday afternoons. So 
That basically meant I would get anywhere between 8 to 14 hours of paid work every week. And I tried to supplement as best as I could with Expertly Dyed, which thank you to everyone who did support me last year. Uh, and all years prior <laughs> and going forward as well um but also it wasn't enough to live on and so i had to resort to cash for jobs uh arrangements and it was difficult because i didn't have a lot of skills that people would just pay money for which sounds crazy um, but I needed something that would allow me to be flexible and uh, not commuting because commuting is very expensive uh, if you don't have a car, train tickets. So I needed something that was going to be local and I basically fell into just making knit repairs and other kind of sewing things for money. <laughs> and. Uh, it was really good that I did because being a foreigner living in the UK, my partner, he needed to have enough of an income in order to support me. <laughs> but because we didn't have two members recognized as uh, UK citizens, <laughs> I did not allow us to qualify for any kind of public funds or governmental support which basically meant my part-time job wasn't enough to sustain us. And I struggled for months trying to find any other supplementary work, part-time, cafe work, you name it, I tried and completely overlooked every single time. And um, it, yeah, it just didn't matter what I did. And so if it weren't for these cash jobs, we would not have made through the month of February even uh, last year. So there were a lot of financial struggles throughout the year. And then um, I basically uh, accepted an offer of someone who wanted to invest in my business. Now, if you remember back then, I was very excited to announce this. And after a couple of months and me getting everything dyed, organized, photographed, test knitted to sort of see how the colors looked out, all of this prep work, it took me a couple of months and full time besides what I was already doing. And um, my investor decided to pull out and leave me with the bill and put a lot of unnecessary demands on me and regardless of my situation basically expected me to work for free until I sold all of this yarn. This is one of the realities of dealing with a craft business where someone who isn't related at all thinks they could help you because they see you and they like what you're doing but they don't truly understand what it means to be on this side of the fence and no matter how much I described that it doesn't work this way to my investor, um, it was ignored repeatedly. And so because of this, I now owe quite a substantial amount with uh, all of these yarn investments that I've made. And so with that kind of bearing down on me, this realization uh, was very upsetting to say the least. And so it made me have to reprioritize how I was spending my spare time. Then, the end of October this year, after having moved so that my partner could have his dream job, I broke my foot. <laughs> and that put me out of work for five weeks. And the statutory sick pay in the UK is really, really not great at all. Like, you cannot support yourself on that kind of income. So it is just been financial struggle after financial struggle and in the back of my mind knowing that all of the things that would help our situation get us um, more job, well get me more job opportunities requires having a car which <laughs> I can't afford and so all of these lows have been quite <sighs> demeaning they belittle me and it's been very upsetting kind of just carrying on forward with it. 
but that's sort of the reality of these micro businesses. Now, for those of you out there who are hearing the story and this sounds very familiar, will commiserate with me because sometimes that's just life and this is not the first time someone has invested in me and my business and then left me bereft of income <laughs> and uh, rethinking the next couple of years. It, it really is a one or two year setback as a result. So things like affording a car or <laughs> being able to afford a down payment on a house is a complete fantasy for all of those things that I mentioned costs a lot of money and if you're not making enough money it's just it's even more devastating and so I have been silent about a lot of this on purpose because I don't want this to be any kind of pity I don't want this to you know, sort of make anyone feel compelled to buy from me specifically, but this is sort of the reality that I have kind of come to in 2023, that I can't keep living as if the world owns my life. It's definitely the other way around. And I'll talk more about that once I reveal my 2022 New Year's resolution. We moved to Sirencester back in September of 2022, and anyone who moves knows just how chaotic it is, and we had very limited resources because again, we don't drive, and where we were moving was quite rural, so getting anything to and from on train was going to be a real hassle. Doable, but kind of a hassle, and we didn't really know anybody in the area, so it was even more so. Uh, so that was very stressful, and then when I finally got here and got things organized and started buying furniture and I broke my foot, I realized that um, my New Year's resolution just might not happen. So uh, I was happy when I did my daily vlog episode, which was filmed back in mid no well early November of, of last year, 2022, and I decided even though this has some issues, I will be happy with it. But also, deep down inside, I wasn't satisfied with that. And um, I don't like being told, no, you can't do that, or no, it's not possible. Because my response is, is it? Is it really not possible? Or do we just not want to consider the possibility that it is? possible. <laughs> and maybe it just requires reworking some free time or uh, thinking differently about how you want to approach the project because people have consistently over the years, decades at this point, told me, oh, well, I don't know how to help you or just figure it out or you can't do that or nobody does that. Well, I am the shining example of all the things that I was told you can't do, not possible to do, and yet I've done them. So I said, okay, I've got a broken foot. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'll do something productive. So after some other um, emotional breakdowns over my finances and trying to figure out what I could do given my extremely limited mobility and the tendonitis, which is much better now, I decided I'm just going to dye this yarn. And so I didn't have the colors that I needed, of course, <laughs> and I didn't have any money to actually buy the colors that I needed because what I wanted to go for was one of my established colorways, Midnight, but I didn't have any more navy. And so how do you make navy? Well, you layer on colors and I, <laughs> I didn't really um, know how this was going to go, but I did film it all. So you can see here how I layered on the colors. Um, it was very scary at first dyeing my hand spun, but I essentially treated it just like any other uh, yarn that I would dye and once I kind of got over the hurdle of the first pass of color I was like this is easy. It's just like everything else. I can't ruin it. If it doesn't turn out right I will just 
use commercial yarn because I've already said that or the sweater that I've already knitted. I'll just count that. So it was just me trying to release some of the tension and anxiety over dyeing because it's hand spun and you can't just go to the store and get more of it. So after several passes of applying color, I came up to this very close facsimile to Midnight. It's not quite as dark as uh, the colorway that I have on my website, but it's very near enough. And so I was really happy with it. I didn't want to fuddle too much because this was unchartered territory. I didn't have um, the colors I needed. And even though I was using my dye calculator as a guide for how much of my solutions I needed, because I was trying to create colors and I didn't know how strong they would be, I had to do multiple passes and then err on the side of less rather than going all in and making it too dark and losing a lot of the variegation that I was aiming for. And so I was really happy with that result. After a few days of drying, because I always like to make sure that it's really, really, really dry before I decide to put it into a project bag, which is usually a plastic bag that I've had for the last 10 years. And so I do that because I like to keep a bunch of other stuff there, needles, notes, um, uh, stitch markers, that sort of thing, all together. And as lovely as it would be to have little pouches for all of my projects. I just don't <laughs> have them. So I just use what I've got a lot of, which are plastic bags, which usually get sent to me from people I, I buy uh, fiber and things like that from. So reuse. Um, so I put them all in there and I let it sit for a little while and thought, what am I actually going to knit? I had a thought of using Tin Can Knits patterns and I went through the website and looked again. Wasn't quite happy with any of the choices. I felt like I wanted more customization and when I did my initial swatch I realized that it would be too much of a challenge this late in the year. So this was uh, beginning of November or like thereabouts. And so I thought well I'll just do another recipe knit and put in my gauge. Luckily, it was actually the exact same as the red and white sweater. So I didn't really have to make any adjustments. The only adjustments that I was going to make involved the small little stitch details. So I did a, a different increase for the raglan and I did some other creative elements. And um, yeah, so I think uh, the reveal is about to happen because why are we talking about it when I can just show you? <laughs> you'll see that I have done a cable pattern in the back. And since you can't really see them when I'm holding it up like that, I also did a pattern for the cuff. So Here's the sleeve, and you can see here that I have also used cables in the sleeve. But I've only done that on the front part of the sleeve. So in the back, it's just plain stitches. That's my decrease zone right there in the back. the decreases along there. And then I've just done a very simple one by one rib in the back, but on the front of the sleeve, or the top part of the sleeve, I did staggered cables. 
So it's a four by four cable, so it's two over two. And I've gone with a two stitch rib in between. So there's two pearls to offset the cables. And then every time I got to a cable twist, I would start the next pearl rib for the next cable on either side. So this is in the middle of the top of the sleeve, and then I mirrored the next ones, and then I mirrored the next ones, all the while doing these um, crosses. And I really love how it turned out. Now, in terms of the back, I didn't want to do a whole lot of shaping for this. But I did want something that kind of gave you a little bit of a nice silhouette and it's really difficult to show while holding it up <laughs> and I will probably have to take more photos of these uh, for the blog in the future. But suffice it to say, if you use a, a, a block in the back of a sweater, kind of like how you would make an adjustable vest or waistcoat by uh, like a little tie or sometimes I've seen like really fancy ones they'll have like a little buckle that you just pull a piece of fabric through and you can tighten it and what it does is it, it just draws it in slightly so that it can be customizable so if you are a woman and depending on the time of the month for you if you need more or less room in your torso region, you can kind of let that out a little bit, right? So that you don't feel uncomfortable in your clothing, right? Or if you've lost weight or you gain a little weight because, you know, the holidays just happened. <laughs> that, that always happens. Don't worry about it. <laughs> It'll go away, I promise. So I decided to take that sewing principle and apply it to knitting. And so I started doing this um, bit of stitching for the cable in the back below the shoulder line. So the shoulder blades are up here. So I basically started a little bit, probably about an inch or a little over an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter down from the underarm of the sleeve. And then I had it set off by four stitches of the pearls. And then I did an eight stitch cable, so it's four over four. And I also had that centered on the back. So there's two, four, six, seven. So this is the central cable in the back. Sorry. So this is the central cable in the back. And then they are mirrored on either side so that this panel was perfectly centered in the back of the sweater. And the way that I did that was by keeping my stitch markers in the underarm where I, I did my cast on to connect um, the underarm stitches so I can knit the main body. So I used those stitch markers as uh, guidelines so I could figure out the midway point. Then, because women tend to have hips that grow, well, in my case, substantially from their waist, I didn't want this pattern of cables to be for the full length of the back. Now the red and white sweater, I talked about this, I basically started the ribbing here and continued all the way to the end. But on this sweater, I wanted to have the edge kind of nip in a little bit. And I don't know if you can really see this at all, maybe if I hold this like this. Hmm? I need to get a better stand. <laughs> for my setup, because this one is as high as it goes. <laughs> and so it sort of, it kind of comes in a little bit and then it flares out a little bit on the sides. And again, it is really difficult to show you, but um, the way that the cables draw in the fabric, it's kind of like ribbing, except parts of it aren't quite as flexible because you've got that twisting point. So when in knitted fabric you do cables and they sort of pinch in right here, that part, it's going to be less stretchy than if it had just been a knitted column all the way down without any twisting. So um, 
when you are designing something like this, it's kind of nice to be able to draw on these little tidbits in knitting that you kind of pick up from other people talking about it or how this functions in, in other um, knitting patterns. So what I basically did is I took this panel and used it instead of doing like decreases and then increases to get sort of like that hourglass shape so that I could have also a visual indication of this is 100% unique. I don't often see a cable block only on the back side of a sweater. <laughs> it's always something on the front. And furthermore, if you are a larger bosomed individual, <laughs> you probably know what I'm talking about here. There's something upsetting about pattern being emblazoned and stretched over your bust line because not only does it draw a lot of attention, but especially with something like cables, because there's usually a little gap there. And if it's machine made, sometimes that little gap isn't cinched together quite as nicely as you would have liked. So that becomes a little bit of a hole. And because it's being stretched across your bust, you can actually see a much larger hole there. And so rather than having wardrobe malfunctions, because we're knitters, we can make these designs suit us rather than have a major company all producing the same thing. So I thought, why not just put the cables where they're going to be functional and have a design element that actually emphasizes the fact that this was handmade, this was designed, and doesn't look like what anyone else would be wearing. In all, I used approximately 1,300 out of my 1,500 yards, and I probably would have used a bit more had I actually finished the collar. So I decided not to because the way that I did the increases in the front, it produces this little bumped edge. And it kind of looked like it was one of the design features. So a little bit of almost like um, pinking shears, you know, they make those little uh, triangles. That's what it looked like to me. And in the back, yes, I get that it's straight stockinette and uh, it's going to have a bit of a, a rolled edge. Which you can, you can see even after having been washed. Get it to focus on the right thing here. Even after having been washed, it still rolls a little bit. But actually, I think that's fine, mainly because I liked the way that the front looked, and there wasn't a real convenient way I could think of to fix the back edge so that it didn't roll. But then I also thought, why does it matter if it rolls? Because usually I've got a load of hair that covers it up. First off, I mean, <laughs> I, I probably need a haircut, but um, no one's gonna see it. Uh, it doesn't bother me that it's rolled. It's not like I can feel it. It's not accentuating something that I dislike. You know, if this this has been sort of like below the, the bust line, or at the very bottom, I probably would have done something about it. But because it's across my neck, it sort of flattens out anyway, because it's right up against my skin. Um, and at the end, I finished this cuff. I did a sewn bind off, which took forever, but it's much nicer than um, what I've done in the past, which is basically a simple... Um, uh, like a slip knot bind off. So um, Vivian Westwood died and I decided in homage in part because she was a little bit um, blasé about rules and I'm very similar in spirit I said to myself, why does it need a collar? If I feel like it looks fine without a collar, then it's my opinion that matters and none others. <laughs> so 
um, it doesn't have a collar. And I actually ended up saving a little bit of yardage, so if I want to use that yarn for something else, I've got about 80 grams left. Um, I'll just maybe weave with it, or maybe I could make a pair of mittens. I don't know, that's, that's definitely enough for a pair of mittens. So, um, yeah, I decided not to finish it, or maybe it is finished and this is just the finishing that I wanted to do. I also made one variation. I did uh, the make one right, make one left increases on the raglan so that it has a slightly um, raised line instead of the yarn over looking um, holes. But otherwise, this is pretty much identical to the other sweater apart from the patterning that I've used to do the shaping and the decoration of the cables on the sleeves. So this is actually a really great way to make alterations of something that is a favorite of yours. Uh, but also, I've realized a lot more about how knitting and spinning have really diverged as crafts and I'm hoping that moving forward, we'll actually be able to integrate that a bit more. So one of my New Year's resolutions for 2023 is to incorporate more knitting into my regular activities in addition to spinning, because one of the things that I loved doing before I got into spinning was knitting. And even though I still knit, I mostly knit because I need something or one of my family members needs something. So in the past it was, well, I need a pair of mittens soon because the ones I'm wearing are about to fall apart. And so I would always just get into a habit of needing to make a pair of mittens before I had to go to work the next day or the next two days in, in case it was a weekend. And so it doesn't really give you a lot of time to focus on expanding your skill base. And when I'm focusing on just spinning, making tutorials and uh, helping troubleshoot various kinds of problems, then it means that I'm not expanding my own knowledge base. And uh, those skills, if you don't use them, they sort of become, well, how do you do the Kitchener stitch again? <laughs> said everybody. <laughs> yeah, so I am endeavoring to basically hone my knitting skills with the view of using my hand spun for the knitting. Now some of the problems I described before where I just, I wouldn't be able to get the row count, but I could get the stitch count. So if I wanted six stitches per inch, usually I could do that. But if it was, you know, nine rows that I was getting, but they want 11 rows, and I'm just like, there's no way I can change the needles to make, you know, like I can't change the stitch height unless I make them really, really tight. And if I'm using my hand spun, depending on what fiber I've chosen, it might not work well if I try to force that fiber to a tighter gauge in terms of how I make the height of the loops on my needle. So that's like loose knitting versus tight knitting will change the height of your stitches a little bit. So instead of doing that, I thought there must be a better way. And so I reached out to Reddit of all places and asked uh, some knitting Redditors, <laughs> which sounds weird, <laughs> uh, about how to sort of get at designer resources so that I understood more about how things were constructed in terms of knitting, how to use various types of increases or decreases, or how to do things with patterns in terms of pattern stitches. And I was suggested a few things. So the first thing I'm going to try is knit to fit, uh, which I have not received in the mail yet, but it, it will, it will come. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that I will actually be able to marry these two crafts back together because spinning allows for a lot of different types of crafts. But for whatever reason, because we've got all this commercial spun yarn available, a lot of patterns are designed with that in mind. And so rather than always having to take a pattern that's already been produced and redesigning it for your yarn, 
because sometimes it is difficult to always spin to a commercial gauge. Um, I wanted to kind of fit into this little niche to accommodate people who are spinners, who enjoy knitting, but are also frustrated how they can't get their hand spun to work like commercial spun. And amplifying that problem with every knitter has their own gauge. <laughs> So um, I'm hoping that I will be able to take this resource and my knowledge of spinning and knitting besides and sort of find ways to um, make adjustments that are very simple where I can take what I've got in terms of hand spun, design a pattern from my gauge and uh, with construction techniques, design whatever it is I want or even come up with something that is very similar to uh, what I've seen from like big box stores um, because sometimes I've seen things on the street and I think that's a really cool sweater or you know vest or whatever you have out there right so uh, I'm hoping to be able to bring these two elements closer together and maybe even inspire other knitters who have had similar issues with uh, their knitting gauge uh, and have kind of broadened out into spinning over the last couple of years um, so that we have even more people kind of working on this idea and sharing their insights from this as well. So here it is. I love this sweater. It's got a really nice soft sheen and that's because of the merino that I used. It was very, very fine. And it feels cuddly. It's not too tight to my body. I didn't make it with um, any extra ease or anything. And I also did short row shaping on this part of the arm, which you can't tell, but because I have a slightly more square shoulder here, I needed the extra amount of fabric not a whole lot, maybe about half an inch or two thirds of an inch um, in this sort of deltoid region here. So what that does is it grows the fabric here without growing it under the arm. That way it can accommodate people who have a more uh, squared off shoulder, which actually might be really great if you're designing a, a sweater like this for a man or particularly one that's broad shouldered or one who works out so they've got, you know, big guns. <laughs> uh, so that's actually a really nice trick. You could just add a few extra rows. That way um, you get more fabric there without it looking like a puff sleeve. I also did um, the make ones rather than the um, knit front back, which I normally would do for a raglan increase. And so you get kind of like this uh, it's sort of a more distinct line down the shoulder, the front, the front of the shoulder here, but it doesn't have those distinctive um, little holes that are made or the bar made from um, the knit front back increases. So I like the way that this looks a little bit better. It looks more refined, which kind of fits the cabling that I did. You can see here a little bit more on um, while I've got it on that you can see uh, the way that that ribbing has turned out and it's actually not as tight to my wrist as I thought it would but you know what it's actually fine I don't that doesn't bother me at all um, but there would be a weight there's ways that you can do that I actually switched to a size one needle to uh, do sorry, a size two needle to finish um, this part here on the cuff. So I did, I did go down a needle size, but it was more of a stitch thing. And if you were going to do this and uh, you knew the length of your arm and the size of your wrist, you could actually map out the decreases a little bit differently than I did, uh, but that's fine. Uh, I don't like it when sweaters are like a death grip around your wrist because I've done so much martial arts and weightlifting I've actually got qu quite <laughs> substantial <laughs> wrists so that doesn't bother me at all I kind of like not having this really really tight 
Um, but if you wanted to, that's definitely a place where you could adjust um, a little bit. And then in terms of the finished neckline, as I said, it doesn't look like it needs anything. It doesn't need any other kind of collar. And if I did, this would actually um, close up more of this uh, upper chest area, which for women is less of an issue, I think. But if you were designing this for a man, this might be a little bit low because it's just at the start of my cleavage. <laughs> so it might be uh, uncomfortable for a man. But for a woman, I feel like it, it kind of sits fine. I don't feel like I'm being choked by a sweater, which is one of the things that I hate. <laughs> and then, like I said in the back, it kind of rolls just a tiny bit there, but because it comes across and down, that fabric just kind of sits flat. It doesn't roll too much, so it doesn't really matter, in my, in my opinion. In my opinion. <laughs> Now, as I said before, I don't have a way of making this much taller in this uh, apartment unless I get a bunch of furniture and that would be a disaster. But you can kind of see how it floats along my natural shape and kind of sits out and it doesn't look like it's really tight here at the bottom. I also did the sewn cast off so this would be a really loose edge anyway. But yeah, it's it's really subtle. It hugs, but it doesn't feel skin tight. And it fits nice in the back as well, right? So it's got this, this slight amount of flare at the bottom because I stopped doing the uh, cables right around here. So you can see how this fabric on the lower part is a little looser because there's no cable to draw in the fabric. And so I've been able to make a very custom looking sweater just by putting in this one design element in the back. One other really quick note I wanted to make about this back cable block. Design it for you. So if you want to do a more intricate style cable, that's fine. If you want to just do a, a shorter length, that's fine. If you want to do something a little longer, that's fine too. But what I would recommend is regularly try it on. And I think for the most flattering shape, if you start just below your shoulder blade line, so you can kind of feel around where it is, yeah? So mine starts just, just about that line. And then you basically want to knit until your hips start to form out. So what that's gonna do is, because there's a lot of elasticity with that cable block pattern, right? There's a point in which your body shape is going to form the hourglass, but you don't want it to be pulled too tightly. So once you start doing it with the cable block, if this is what you want to do, try it on regularly. When it gets to your hip line, right, put it back on to make sure that it still looks okay. And then you basically want to do Incre uh, you want to increase the overall length 
as the established pattern in blocks that allow you to finish the cable. So after you do a twist, you want to knit however many rows that you need to knit. For me, that was every 10 rows, I did a cable twist, which corresponded to about every inch. So I wanted to make sure to have it mirrored, I would always do a inch intro and an inch outro of the cable pattern. <laughs> Hopefully this makes sense. So uh, you don't want to end on a twist and you don't want the bottom to be too short compared to the top because it will be noticeable. So you want it to be as symmetrical on the top as it is at the bottom and vice versa and the same on the sides. So when you put it on and you know that your waist to hip um, length, right? That, um, that measurement is going to be contingent on your body. So if you have a wide hip versus your waist, you might want to stop the cable pattern a little shorter on your body. That way it won't look stretched as it's trying to fit down over your hips. If you have a smaller disparity between your waist to your hip, you may actually even opt to do the entire back panel as cables. That way you get that nice nipped in look without having to do those increases and decreases. And you don't have to worry about how this is going to sit on your hips because it's not going to be as stretched across that part of your body. So hopefully this little tip kind of helps you design this type of cable block uh, that will fit you and your body or whoever you're going to be designing this for. And I think this is probably the most important part. You don't have to use hand spun for this. And if you have a commercial pattern, like a go-to sweater pattern that you always like using, try this, see if it works for that pattern as well. Um, so it doesn't have to be with a recipe knit, like what I've done creating the design out of the gauge. So there's lots of ways that you can embed something like this into a sweater pattern that's already existing that maybe you've tried doing some increases and decreases to get it to have a better fit and it's just not really working or can't figure it out. This is so much simpler, very easy to keep track of. Uh, and you can use stitch markers to keep track of your number of rows. So, you know, it's it's pretty effortless. I'm, I'm glad that I did it. Um, and I'm kind of amazed, shocked even, <laughs> how I had this idea and I said, I wonder how this will look. And so I just knitted thinking, you know, this might go bad, <laughs> but we're gonna see how it turns out. And then I was making these little adjustments to my plan as I went, because sometimes you kind of go through this period of doubt. But when I got there, I thought, no, I think this looks pretty good. And then I tried it on and then I had pictures taken of me and everything. And also I was bearing in mind that there might be a situation where once it's washed, it doesn't look as good. <laughs> So you always have that little caveat in the back of your head because it's going to change a little bit once you've washed it and whether you block it or you don't block it, I didn't block this one, that's also gonna change the fit a little bit. But I was just so pleased <laughs> with how it came out. It's my new favorite thing. I'm probably gonna wear it a lot. I will need to make more because I'm gonna wear this one out. Should definitely keep some spare yarn to make any repairs, which, they will probably happen at some point. Um, so yeah, I am very pleased with how it turned out. I'm going to have some more photos uh, of this with the recipe um, knit. Once I get that uh, finalized into a PDF, it will go on the blog, uh, well, my website, actuallydyed.com. Uh, and I'll probably also have it available on Ravelry because I know some of you still use uh, the site and want to keep things uh, in a queue. So I will make it available uh, there as well. Uh, but yeah, I am overall happy with the color. The texture is really nice. I tried really hard to not knit this too tightly. Um, it, was, it was a lot of things and a lot of frustrations that I had in 2022 
almost fueled my desire to make this work. <laughs> and I, I'm so glad that it worked out. I'm, I'm glad for all the people who said, yeah, just make a sweater, just do it. Yeah, just keep going. And so I did, and I'm glad that I did. And it probably would have happened even without so much support. But if you were out there and you had this idea to maybe do this alongside me, um, or I gave you the idea and you're like, yeah, I should do that too. And maybe you've kind of fallen off a little bit. It's fine, just pick up your needles, get back to it. And even if it takes you a few years, well then, hey, it took a few years. <laughs> In conjunction with this idea, because the the knitting skills using hand spun to kind of influence how I'm knitting, that's really the main New Year's resolution for my crafting. But also stash busting. <laughs> so um, I know everyone has it. When you first start getting into knitting, you have all these little leftover bits. When you get into spinning and you're knitting, you always have lots of different types of leftover bits. And so in order to kind of pare some things down so that I have more space to store what I need to store properly, um, I need to work more on using those yarns rather than just holding on to them and remembering and reminiscing over the experience of spinning it or what I was thinking about or what my initial goal was or you know, what year? I remember which year <laughs> I made some of my yarns. <laughs> so rather than just doing that all the time um, and moving them from country to country and house to house, I thought I'm actually going to do more with that. And because my Christmas gift this year was a loom stand, I no longer have to sit on the floor to weave. <laughs> So look forward to some more videos where I talk a little bit about my Kromsky loom stand and uh, some of the projects I have lined up for it. Uh, the first of which um, is going to be my Torta Fleece blanket, which I've had to also supplement some hand dyed yarn because I didn't quite spin enough during uh, Torta Fleece. Uh, but that's good because it was just sitting there not being used and so I'm going to use it. And uh, it'll be an interesting weave because there are different gauges, different fiber contents, hand spun, commercial spun, stuff that I dyed many years ago and stuff that I've only recently dyed. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be interesting and I will take you through it uh, as a process and talk a little bit more about how to incorporate the two different types of yarn together because they do behave differently on the loom and um, I think it would be worth showing as well as talking about it. Now that we've made it to the end of the video, I want to know what your crafting year's resolutions are, or maybe this is a really good time to make some. If you don't know how to make good crafting New Year's resolutions that you think you could actually achieve over the course of the year, please watch my video, which I will link below, and as always, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. You can also follow me on various social networks, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. And I've also got my website, expertlydyed.com, and my Patreon, where I post new content there first, uh, and sometimes additional behind-the-scenes type stuff, as well as getting access to all of my videos first, ad-free. So, thank you so much for watching. 